Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Depending on where and when you're watching this, I want to welcome you to the Work on Climate Marketing, Sales, and Go-to-Market 101 workshop. Myself, Jonathan Stokely, and my fellow host and presenter, Adam Gordon. Good morning, Before everybody. Before we jump into the presentation, I'm going to hand it off to a valued member of our team, Kim, to go ahead and show us, uh, tell us what about work on climate, why we're here, um, and a little bit more what you can expect. Hey, everybody. I am Kim. I'm the program manager for Founders. I'll tell you a little bit more um, about that, what, what that means in a second. But work on climate is here to solve the climate talent crisis. Uh, as you can see, building a climate positive economy is going to require so many more, millions more people uh, by 2030 than we have right now. Um, we are working on addressing this talent bottleneck. Um, the current systems we have in place will not get us there. And so work on climate is focused both on direct programming, like what we're doing today, but also systems-wide change. Um, so as we move into 2025, um, tackling some pretty big projects, um, some pretty big problems. So uh, keep in touch and uh, keep your eyes, especially in the newsletter, for um, more updates coming your way on, on that level. Um, but we're so happy to have you here today uh, with our awesome SMEs. Okay, that next slide, Jonathan. So our founder sub community, which you may or may not be a part of, uh, depending on when you originally joined Work on Climate. If not, come join us. It is hashtag role founders in Slack. Um, this is where you will find all of the best updates on any kind of programming related to you, to uh, running a business, starting a startup, um, regardless of what stage you're in. We have other SMEs in addition to the two uh, great guys we have here today. Um, so you can get your questions answered about everything from fundraising to marketing to um, hiring great talent and more. So join us there. And if you have suggestions for other type of programming you want to see, hit me up. I am uh, Kim Dryden on Slack. My email is there at the bottom. Uh, we are all ears. We're trying to make this community as useful for you as we possibly can. And to do that, I need to hear from you. So I hope to see you all in there. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Kim. Again, my name is Jonathan Stokely, subject matter expert for the Founders and Finance Channel. Uh, I've got a pretty deep and steep, uh, diverse background doing almost everything in business uh, from sales and marketing at fast growing startups to engineering management and technical implementations at large, slow bureaucratic global banks like Deutsche Bank. Um, I founded an incubator and accelerator several years ago, CoVenture. Today we've helped 28 different startups raised 24 million VC funding, as well as help thousands of others uh, with programming, uh, kind of ideate all the way to figure out, you know, and launch their business. Uh, I love helping founders succeed. Uh, we need more startups in the world. And especially as it comes to the climate crisis, I've made the decision to kind of devote the rest of my life helping figure this out um, because I truly believe that business is the way to figure it out. Um, you know, as you see here, my family, my son was born eight months ago and, you know, climate change isn't slowing down. We have to move faster. Uh, we have to be better. We have to innovate quicker. We have to solve this problem. And you know, climate tech and a lot of your climate th startups are the way to do so. And I'm here to help you figure it out and move faster because we have to. Adam? Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are, everybody. I'm Adam Gordon. I am a longtime tech marketer and have pivoted completely now into the climate space. Um, what I do is I help companies get their words exactly what right. I work on the verbal brand. And what that does is it helps companies accelerate their growth and accelerate their success. I have helped a bunch of companies grow. Um, the first one I did my modern process with went from 17 million to 100 million in four years. And um, if I can do that with a bunch of climate tech companies, we'll, help, we'll be helping save the world. And um, that's really what drives me. I have two kids that I'd like to arrange to be never climate refugees. Um, and I've helped companies from Cisco to small startups um, grow, launch products, get at the word out faster. Um, one of my most notable um, um, uh, uh, achievements in the past uh, couple of months has been the company that makes this, which is paper-based uh, bubble wrap. Uh, we increased their social reach 3,600% in 90 days, and it was all through better storytelling. Um, and I've totally shifted off to climate now and I'm available to companies to help them grow and succeed. Thank you, Adam. And we both ha 
host weekly office hours uh, on the Founders channel helping solve problems. Uh, so whether it's marketing, investment strategy, as Kim said, uh, we're here to help. Uh, so, you know, work on climate is very much a community of people working together, um, but we need your help to grow it. Um, so we'd love you to, you know, post us on LinkedIn, uh, post on the Work on Climate um, community. If you find anything of value, what we said, you know, give us a shout out, tag us on LinkedIn. Uh, we're here to help and we're here to grow the movement. And the more, you know, buzz we can create, more marketing uh, we can create, the more people will be aware. Uh, so, you know, again, we had 100 something people signed up. We've got 40 something in the room right now. If everybody just takes a second, writes down what they learn, tag us in it. Uh, and shares it out, you know, think of the network effect that we could reach by really pushing this out and, and you know, educating the world on what work and climate is and how we're here to help. Um, so with that, I want to say, hold on, we're going to move fast uh, because of the founders community. Uh, we love to have you post any questions in there. Uh, we'll be doing kind of an AMA style for the next uh, little while. I mean, technically, the founders channel is always an AMA with the SMEs, but uh, you know, there's a lot to cover um, and we're going to be pushing the limits. We might have some time at the end for questions, um, but really, if you have anything, pop it over there and we'll make sure we get it done. We've got an hour to chop through uh, three very complex topics. You are going to hear lots of uh, information that kind of builds on itself. And you get your pen and paper, uh, take some notes. Uh, there's going to be a lot here to unpack. We'll share the recording and the slides afterwards, um, but you know. Move fast and hang on because we, like I said, we got to move quicker. So, Adam, why don't you tell us what marketing is? Absolutely. And just because I'm not sure I quite caught it, any we may or may not have time for any Q and A at the end of this. But if you ask your questions in Slack, we'll make sure we get back to them and answer them as quickly as we can. So, what is marketing? Um, it's a question I hear a lot. Um, and actually, it's the at the very base, it's how you let the world know that your product and company exists and how you listen to the world um, to understand what it is they want and what it is they need and how you can market and sell to them more effectively. Um, so the basis of this is bi-directional communication. Marketing used to be thought of as you just push messages out. Um, but now with uh, the advent of digital marketing and all of the various tools we've got, it really does need to be a bi-directional communication. And that's how you build a very strong brand. And that's at the basis of everything you'll do for marketing. A strong brand is going to be the one of the biggest product differentiators you can have. So it's the process of figuring out what are the strengths of your product, how to talk to your market in a way such that they get it how to reach your market in a way that's effective and cost-effective, and then watching that and getting feedback from that and tuning your whole process as you go. Um, the data gathering and the tuning is really an essential part of marketing these days. Um, it's easy to send lots of stuff out. Um, it's much harder to send stuff out, watch what happens, look at the data, analyze it, and then use that to tune your system so that each communication gets better and better and your whole system gets better and better. The other piece of it is informational, is knowing who the markets are, um, knowing who the audiences in each market are. You know, you may have a market that's, you know, 30 to 50 year old um, women who are college educated and live in the Midwest. But that further breaks down into do they have kids? Do they not have kids? What kind of car do they drive? What their other demographics might be? And you want to understand who those people are as much as you possibly can. Um, and understand how they talk about what their pain is that you're solving in, in their market. Ideally, your marketing is going to be educational, it's going to be entertaining, and it's going to evoke an emotion. And the key here is evoking an emotion. The human brain evolved over millions of years to do a couple things well, and all of them are based on starting with an emotional state. So fear, happiness, joy, curiosity, interest, any one of those things, don't be afraid to use emotional language in your marketing. It's going to help you get your message across even better. And if you don't do this, or if you're one of those people who think if we build it, they will come, that's the fastest way to kill a, kill a company, no matter how good your product is. If nobody knows about it, your days are numbered. So sales, what is sales? Um, really, it's just that exchange. Uh, hey, I, you've agreed to buy something, and I've convinced you to buy it. Uh, sales is really the lifeblood of the company because it generates revenue, it is what pushes money into the organization. Um, I know there's uh, a lot of nonprofit founders here, and I want to definitely take a slant to understand and demonstrate how and why 
nonprofits should be approached as for profits because uh, you know, at the end of the day, they still need money. Um, so think of like anytime we're saying like customers, especially for nonprofits, they're your donors. Those are the people who give you money. You have to convince them to buy your product or service. So whether you're a for-profit or nonprofit, you know, you still have customers and you still have to convince them that they should buy. So what is go-to-market strategy? Uh, well, it's kind of the tying of the marketing and sales all together. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about strategy. Uh, marketing alone has strategy. Sales alone has strategy. But when you bring the two together, it's really that cohesive bond that works together uh, because marketing and sales have to work together. It's the plan. Because as we all know, if you don't plan, you're going to fail. So it's really can, all about, you know, making sure you minimize your risks to maximize your potential output and success. So it, in summary, it's how, you, it's how you implement your strategy and how yeah. you're going to tie sales and marketing together. If they're not all rowing in the same direction, the boat just spins in circles. And, you know, in summary, these are kind of what marketing, sales, and go-to-market is. You know, you create awareness, you drive that decision, and you use the go-to-market to the execution, and as Adam said, strategy behind it all. So what's the goal of everything we're talking about? Money. You know, I hate to be, uh, you know, Mr. Krabs here, but at the end of the day, this is what it's about. If your organization, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, doesn't make money, you're not going to stick around. I know we all have very altruistic approaches and outlooks and, you know, even demonizing the concept of capitalism and money. But at the end of the day, if your organization does not make money, it's not going to survive. We have to move faster, quicker, and cheaper to beat the status quo of the current market equilibrium. And if we want to do so, if we want to save the world, your organizations have to make money, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. So like I said, it's the lifeblood of all everything in your organization, you have to generate the money as fast as you can. It's the way to get, you know, make sure you're up and funded as quick as you can. Don't rely on investors, don't rely on grants. Figure out what the market wants, produce that product and grow. Grow as fast as you can. Use the money from your sales or your donations that you're getting in the door because it's the quickest way to validate if your customers and the product you're producing has worthwhile. If people are buying, that's the signal you're looking for. Everything else, you know, you're still struggling to get your product to market or your service or your nonprofit. So quick tangent advice. I know I said this, but I cannot impress upon this enough. We have to move faster. Your organization has to make money. And that is the point of today's. We use, use marketing to create awareness, sales to drive the decision and the strategy to get it done. So please, we have to move faster because the world, my kids, our kids, we all depend on it. So sales plus marketing is the sales funnel. You know, marketing really, as we said, drives that awareness. We like to call it a sieve more than a funnel because there are definitely customers you're not targeting. You don't wanna just throw everybody in there. You wanna be able to shake some people out. Marketing drives people down the funnel. So it creates the awareness. You know, it depends on the company, the budget, and the marketing, how and where sales takes over. Uh, sometimes it's a lot higher in the funnel. Uh, sometimes it's a little lower. But you know, marketing is what brings people in and creates that awareness while sales is that final handshake to close it or click in a lot of terms in terms of digital online marketing. And so, just to make you, a comment about yeah. that, I hate the term sales funnel because everything you put into the top of a funnel comes out the bottom. And that's just not the way sales work. Sales is a sieve where you can get rid of the folks that you don't want to be talking to. So the ones that do drip out the bottom are the ones with high interest. And again, B2C versus B2B, there's gonna be a lot of acronyms. I'll do my best to explain them. Uh, business to consumer, a customer relies on marketing more. Uh, most of the products you buy uh, in the store, as you, a customer, consumer, uh, you know, they're targeted at you through marketing. Think of everything you buy from all the incessant and nonstop car ads you see to even Coca Cola. It's amazing how Coca Cola is just used in motion to sell soda across the world. It's probably one of the most well known brands in the world. Um, you know, salespeople are still there, such as, you know, car sales to close the deal. But chances are marketing is what led you there. You've already made the decision to purchase. The salesperson is just there to convince you to do so. So an example like Apple Genius, you know, they're there. They're not salespeople. They're there to help you. But at the same time, they still sell you phones and other devices. You know, business to business uh, relies on sales more. They typically just leverage marketing to drive you down the funnel. Uh, think of the marketing for the B2B as more of a the support tool 
Um, and chances are you've never heard of 99.9% .9 of the business to business customers out there. I'm sure there's probably a few people who've heard of Uline out there. Um, Salesforce is another one. I kind of wanted to pick that those tangible customers or businesses out there that leverage and do some public marketing. But chances are, like, you're never going to buy from them unless you're a business. Unless you're a nonprofit, you'll never purchase Salesforce on your own. Unless you need, you know, equipment for your your business, you're never going to look at Uline Magazine. Uh, so you think of how like business to B two C versus B two B leverage marketing and where and how that salesperson steps in depending on what you're selling to the public. So you know again, what's the difference between a nonprofit versus a for profit? Mostly taxes. It's how they file their taxes. Uh, there's a lot of terms and descriptions that are a little different, but at the end of the day, as I said, nonprofits should still use have to use marketing, sales, and go to market strategy to reach their donors because their product or service is their cause and they're using the sales strategies as fundraising. As I said, they still rely on money or donations for their donors to support and drive their cause. So, you know, again, B2C, nonprofit, uh, you know, it kind of uses a lot of the same tools for individual donors. You gotta demonstrate that value. You gotta convince the customers to donate. It's kind of marketing sales. Uh, and then provide communication updates and impact. What are they doing? How are they doing it? And how are they actually using your dollars to drive that difference? Um, that's marketing. And then making them feel special for those repeat donations. That's just go-to-market strategy 101. You know, B2B, when you're approaching some of the bigger organizations, corporates, grants, foundations, uh, you're still using that. I mean, think about like SBIR grants. They hold regular informational sessions where you can develop relationships with the decision makers who approve your grant. You can find out from them if they're entertaining and looking at deciding whether to fund the, your type of organization. You know, that's sales and marketing 101, you know, going through the process, submitting your reporting, and then most importantly, getting that year over year giving. How do you sign up so they keep writing concurrent checks? Because as we know, repeat purchases and word of mouth are some of the best. So what's some of the biggest not mistakes in nonprofits? You know, they think they're different, they operate. They still require the money. They still produce revenue. My local hospital is a nonprofit, but based on my bill, I would never know it. You know, thinking about the different nonprofits you probably interact with every day that operate as a for-profit, but they file their taxes as a nonprofit. You know, they still have the money problems. They still have to be efficient and they still use people, technology and infrastructure. And most importantly, can leverage data to improve their efficiency. And on that note, Adam, take it away. Okay, so how do you do marketing? What is it? Um, one of the first things you need to do is understand your product and your company really deeply um, and know what the core narrative is that you're telling. Um, once you have that as a foundation, then you can go off and start creating ways to reach your customers. Those are generally some kinds of campaigns. Um, they could be a combination of things like email, social media, um, external stuff like out of home video, billboards could be any combination of probably a hundred different channels that you might use. And it's the process of actually creating the stuff that you'll send out. We call that content um, and then delivering it in the most effective and cost effective manner. Um, you may find that it's easiest to reach some people on the website of a magazine that um, is common in your industry. You may find that there are social media channels that are better. You may find LinkedIn being great, or you may find LinkedIn being terrible, depending on what your product is and how your company operates. And the way you'll find that out is to do some initial customer discovery. And as you're doing customer discovery for your product, you also want to do customer discovery of how you reach the people that are going to be your customers and what's the best way to do that. And then you're going to test, 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 test. And the more you can gather data and show yourself exactly what people are responding to, what channels are they responding over, and how do they like to respond, um, you'll be able to tune your marketing so that it becomes an, as efficient machine as possible. You can only get so efficient in marketing, let's be clear. There's a general algebra to it, um, and you're trying to affect people's behavior, so it just takes some time and some effort. And the algebra is it takes about seven to nine touches to get anybody to do anything. Click a link, fill out a form, make a call, whatever. People see maybe a third of what we send out. Um, so that math is easy. It's 21 to 27 outreaches to get those seven to nine touches, to get anybody to do anything. And that 
is where the brand comes in really strongly because if there's not a th clear theme in all of that, if some of them look, smell, taste, sound different, then you just have to do those again because people won't know they're coming from you. So this is where a strong brand and a strong communications plan really become uh, critical and uh, vital to your success. Um, the stuff that you send out, especially these days, can't just be informational. You need to grab people, which means you need to evoke an emotion and then use that moment when you've got them hooked to inform them. The human brain is much more open once it's snapped, once it's snapped open by, a, by an emotion. Entertainment is great, but it doesn't always have to be entertaining, um, but it does always have to be emotional. And once you've got that emotional state, then you can start educating and delivering your message. And so what are the problems with it? Um, people think it's easy. It's not. Um, you know, if you had Betty Crocker in your kitchen, it would be easy to make a cake. And if you don't have Betty Crocker in your kitchen, if you're not a baker, it's going to be more of a challenge. Um, so my recommendation to everybody here is get help with your marketing. Um, one of the reasons is you guys are really close to your products. It's where you should be. I call it the bark problem. Forget the forest for the trees. It's the bark for the tree. And that is where you need to be to make your product successful, to make a good product, to make a good company, to really be in tune with your customers. And it's a very difficult place to market from because to market well, you need a certain perspective of the wider market. Um, so get help with that and um, you'll find your marketing is much better. Um, it's really easy to forget to track data. Don't do that. Um, the data is going to have you be more successful faster. Um, and you know, anyone can do this, but not everyone's a writer. Not everyone is a graphic artist. Not everyone knows how to do websites. Get the help that you need and don't try and do it all yourself because um, nothing kills. There's an old joke in marketing. Nothing kills a bad product better than good marketing, but also nothing kills a good product faster than bad marketing. So get the help you need, even if it's just advice. And, um, you know, there are various ways to do it um, economically, um, but it's a specialization and you want help with that specialization in order to be the most effective for it with it. Um, and then we go talk about branding. So what is a brand? A brand is, is the way your customers perceive your company and your product. And everything you do is going to elevate your brand or decrement yeah. your brand. And you need to be aware of every customer interaction. And that goes from the earliest stuff that you send out um, in your marketing to stop to start filling the top of that sieve and the final stuff that you do to close the deal and then support them post deal. All of that is going to be important to your brand. A brand is not just a font, a logo, a color palette, a style of talking, um, you know, who your personas are. It is all of that but it's also the impression you leave um, people with as they interact with your company. And the better you can leave that impression, the stronger your brand is gonna be and the more recognizable you'll, come, you'll become in the market. Um, and don't try to do it on your own. Take a look at companies that you love, that you think are great. You know, a lot of people use Apple for inspiration. As a marketer, I kind of get tired of hearing it. It's like, oh, make it like Apple. Well, not everybody is Apple, but it doesn't mean they're doing things that you can't emulate. Never steal stuff directly, but take inspiration from them. You know, go look at other websites. Go look at how other companies are doing it, especially your competition. Stuff that makes you smile and feel good or inspires you because it makes you afraid is probably stuff that you can emulate and leverage off of. So define what your, decide what your top three brands are or your top seven. Don't go much more than that. Take a look at how they're doing it and how you can apply those lessons to your own company. Um, and then um, I have a little bit of issue with this slide because um, I think context is king and content is queen um, because any piece of content can be changed by its context. But the context is your brand and the content is what you're talking about and what you're, what you're saying about your brand. Um, this becomes critically important. A lot of companies don't figure out what their core narrative is, what their key story is. Um, and I'm always surprised by that because I see how much it affects companies and how much it um, accelerates success. So figure out what your themes are, what's important to your market, how you talk about them to your market. Think about how you tune that, 
for market channel and goal um, and how you need to talk to people and over which channels you need to do that. Um, this can be everything from simple posts that you do on LinkedIn or any other social media to your entire website, to the way you package your goods, or the way you deliver your products, how you reach people. Um, all of this is important in terms of creating a stream of content that's well-branded and drives people back to you. Um, and then, you know, it, basically we break this down into two big methodologies. The digital world, um, it's easy. It's a lot easier. It's a lot less expensive. Um, it's pretty straightforward. The mechanisms are pretty well known. The algorithms are pretty well known. It's easy to track. Um, and that makes all of that really great. Um, I'm a big believer in that you can't just be online. For most companies, you also need to have some kind of offline presence, whether that's actually in a magazine or a journal or a billboard or a radio ad. There's tons of th different things you can do these days. And it's not impossible to track that stuff. People think that it is. But through the use of creative URLs or QR codes or things like that, you can use offline marketing and still track approximately, not as well as with digital marketing, but you can absolutely track how well that stuff is doing. And you need to be able to do that. And these two will complement each other. The more touch points you can have, if somebody sees you on a billboard and then sees you pop up on an ad on the, one of their websites, that's a much better um, way to reach customers than just having one or the other. And ultimately, you want to know where your customers go for information. You want to understand something about their lives and where they are on a day-to-day -day basis so that you can be at those critical moments when they're thinking about the pain that they've got because they're not using you. And so campaigns are how you execute a specific part of your marketing. This may be after a certain segment of your market. It may be as you launch a new product. Um, it could be any number of things that have some specialization to them. Um, ultimately, what you want to do is um, drive awareness in this market or extend your reach into that market. You want to start with clear objective and goals. Um, if that's not where you start, you never know whether you're winning or losing. And that's a shame because you're going to pour a lot of time, money, and energy into these campaigns. So define what your goals are, define who the market is, um, define how you're going to get to them, what the messages are going to be, how are you going to pay for it, and all the rest of the things you can see there. And my really strong recommendation of this is test, 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 test. You can do tons of A and B testing to find out what makes a better campaign. And the more you know that, the more effective your campaigns will be. And here's a, just a huge list of campaign types. This is just what we threw together in 10 minutes. There's probably 100 more. Um, so be creative in this. Don't get stuck in one. Um, you need multiple touch points, especially these days, in order to grab customers' attention and keep it over time, which is what you're going to need to do. Um, ultimately, you want to be well-known enough to customers or to prospects that when they come up with your problem, you are who they think of. And what is the point? Is to drive awareness and gather data um, and make sales drive people to your website. One thing I really want to emphasize extremely strongly, and I cannot say this strongly enough, do not ever do a campaign that drives people to your homepage of your website. Never, ever do that because your homepage is designed to be a general information portal. And these campaigns, you want people doing something. Landing pages are where campaigns should lead. And the landing page has a little bit on it, a little bit of information and some kind of action that people can take. But if you drive people to your homepage, all you're gonna do is confuse them and piss them off. And that's the last thing you wanna do. So what are the best practices here? Come up with a hypothesis and try and prove it and disprove it. Figure out where you're right, where you're wrong. Um, set smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. Um, know whether you're meeting those or not know what metrics are going to tell you with, if you're meeting that or not. Of course, you need to understand your audience, create great content, um, the right channels, and measure, test, and tune, rinse and repeat. Measure, test, and tune, rinse and repeat. Um, and then overall, in your business and also in your campaigns, there's a ton of data that's available to you these days, and it's easy to get lost in the sea of data. That is a 
direct path to failure. So in your business, and you need to look at this carefully, there's probably something between three and five or three and seven data points that are really critical to your success. Make a dashboard with those on it. You can look at the other stuff because it may be supportive, but these are the key metrics that you want to be tracking and you want to probably be increasing or decreasing if it's things like costs. Don't get lost in the sea of data. It's just a path to analysis paralysis and lack of action is, is almost worse than taking a slightly off action. Um, so figure out what those are, figure out really what are the critical ones for your business and focus on those. The rest of them are probably vanity metrics. For instance, the company that I worked with that made this paper bubble wrap, they wanted likes, but they couldn't tell me how their likes were associated with their sales process. So it was just a vanity metric that somebody on the board wanted. Don't get lost in those. Focus on the data that really matters to drive your business and drive your revenue. And there's a ton of reasons why things work and why they don't. You've got the wrong message. You've got the wrong colors. You're using the wrong story. You're telling the wrong language. Something has happened in the world that is distracting people. Um, you know, because a strategy isn't working in the first 15 days doesn't mean it's a bad strategy. Sometimes you need to look and see, maybe it needs a little bit more time and maybe there's stuff going on. You need to be really tuned into what's going on in the world and tuned into the data that you're getting back from your campaigns and um, be a little creative in how you interpret that. Um, on my website, there's a phrase that I completely stole from some website in the internet. I don't even remember what it is now, but it says a story without data is a fantasy and data without a story is boring. So the data that you get in there, there's a story in it and figure out what that story is. And when you will get to understand that, you'll understand how to interpret that data to make your campaigns better. And then we both, Jonathan and I are really strongly in agreement with this. Create a marketing calendar, um, at least 90 days out, know what you're doing and start creating content today for three months from now. If you can get 90 days ahead, you'll have much better content because you'll have time to actually think about it. If you're constantly rushing around trying to make tomorrow's post, your posts are gonna look and sound like that. Um, and they're gonna be less effective and they're gonna be less well thought out and they're not gonna be responsive necessarily to what's going on in the world. Um, and that is some of the best marketing that you can do to respond to stuff happening in your industry, stuff happening in the world. You know, Current events are a critical part of leveraging your marketing. So plan three months to a year out. Don't make it rigid. Have it be flexible so that you can respond to stuff. Plan everything and start creating today. You know, one of the jokes I have about uh, the local government here and everywhere is the best time to invest in infrastructure is 10 years ago. So that means you need to be doing it constantly now. You need to be creating content every week for next month, for three months out, for a year out sometimes. Um, Having that will give you the time to do a couple of things. Plan, edit, tune, and play with it. Um, I believe that play is a really big element in positive marketing. And if you can get people in that state of play, if you can relate to that, if you can send that out to people and have them be in that state, it's a state that people are very open to gather new data, to understand new information, and to respond to you. And take it bit by bit. Don't try and do it all at once. You know, meet with your team every week and start creating this or twice a week or three times a week, whatever the cadence is that's right for you. It's a big task. It's an enormous task. And it's one of the most critical tasks of your business. One of the challenges I run into a lot in dealing with companies is companies tend to be run on what I call the tyranny of the urgent. And if all you're ever doing is responding to emergencies, you never actually get to that really important stuff. And marketing, and maybe this is my bias, is one of the most important things that any executive is gonna do on any day. Um, so give yourself time for it, make it sacred time, make sure you take the time to do it because it's one of the most important factors in the success of your business. There's a ton of automated tools out there, ton of ranges of expenses from free to $10,000 a month. The best one for you is the one everybody will use and the one that you can actually make the best use of. Um, some of them are amazingly complicated. Some of them are amazingly simple. 
figure out which one your team and you will use, and that's probably the best one for you. Um, ease of use trumps functionality every day. And know your competition really deeply. Um, one of the most important things about marketing is being able to differentiate your product from everybody else out there. And you need to be able to talk about that on a dime. And those words need to be able to come out of your mouth or come out of your fingers onto your computer really quickly and easily. Um, the positioning of your product and the differentiation of your product is one of the most important things that you're going to communicate to people because there are a few really new products out there, but mostly you'll be competing with, at very least, the status quo. People are easy. It's easy to not change. But at the very most, there may be 10 other competitors um, that you need to differentiate yourself from. And that is a key part of what's, what's going to drive people to you. So not knowing, don't know your competitive advantage at your peril. That's the message on that slide. Thank you, Adam. And I appreciate all that great marketing advice. Uh, There's a lot there. So I hope everybody was following along. I mean, you're for nonprofits following basically the same stuff. You can use all the tools, the tricks, and everything Adam talked about, especially nonprofits need a lot of help to get their message out there and why they're different. Because uh, they're not only competing against other nonprofits, but you know, nonprofits are competing for every dollar that you could spend somewhere else. So the best advice to nonprofits is use every marketing tool that Adam just talked about. So sales. There's a lot about sales, you know, whether you're prospecting, building leads, especially building relationships, presenting solutions on why your they should buy from you to solve their problem. And ultimately, it's about closing the deal. Uh, you know, always be closing ABCs of sales. It's about you know taking that marketing awareness and then making them get out their wallet to purchase. You know, sales teams are all about people. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of teams and people, um, but really kind of comes down to two major buckets inside or outside. But you know, ultimately sales is a numbers game. You know, you're going to make a hundred phone calls. You're going to have a hundred meetings. Um, but you know, one of those or two of those are going to be people that actually buy. So you know, a lot of sales is you kind of just kind of churn through, but you know, have to develop those relationships to do it. So there's definitely much a chess game that is played, but you know, understanding your segment market and your territories based on geography and you know, demographics and some of those other things really help narrow down who you're targeting and how you're targeting them. Uh, sales, just like marketing, is all about the data. Uh, you know, what are your KPIs, key performance indicators, you know, leads generating, phone calls made, deals closed, importantly, revenue generated, goals, commissions, um, and, you know, again, pipeline activity. How many sales do you have in the hopper that you can make? How many people are almost getting ready to buy that you need to keep following up with? You know, different types of sales, like I said, uh, you know, whether it's your inside as a telemarketer, when I worked at Groupon, I basically said, here's your phone, the internet, your territory, you know, go sell, make money. Uh, outside sales still uses some of the tactics of, of inside sales, uh, but, you know, they're actually face-to-face. -face. You'd be surprised in how many solar companies are actually using people in neighborhoods that just drive around and look for people without their solar on their house and go sell to them. Say, hey, we're selling solar. Would you be interested? I see you don't have solar on your roof. Uh, direct sales is one of the easiest and best uh, it's recurring uh, purchases. Uh, you really just want to keep the customer happy uh, because they're probably going to buy no matter what. Um, and unless your product breaks or, you know, they are happy with how they get treated. And uh, even then, a lot of times you just kind of keep purchasing it. Um, and enterprise corporate sales. It's, uh, you know, super relationship based. Uh, it's critical to have both the online and offline contact. Uh, you know, whether that's an event, happy hour, conference. Uh, you have to do everything and be where they are. Your customers are to develop that relationship because you got to stay top of mind and stay with the emails, calls, you know, beyond the, just the events. Um, you know, the, the direct sale, enterprise sales can take not days, not months, sometimes years to get done. Uh, you know, the bigger the fish, the bigger the sale, the longer it takes done because there's more approval inside. You know, again, that time kills. The more time you allow to stop being in front of them, the more time they could forget about you, forget about your solution. You know, the, really the keys to enterprise selling to those larger organizations is making it easy for them to sell you internally. The more you give them, uh, the more likely they're going to be able to sell on your behalf. Uh, you know, their budgets and quarterly cycles change. Uh, when do they make purchases? Who are the purchasers? Uh, make sure you're set up for that next financial decision because they you want to get in their budget so they can make and allocate money. You know, how do you do this? Well, you just ask. You know, you'd be surprised once you develop that relationship, how often the people inside 
are going to help you because you're helping solve their problem. And so they want to be able to say yes. They just have a lot of approvals and process before they can do so. You know, biggest part about sales, as I said, is data. You know, salespeople love to talk, but that's actually, to me, one of the worst approaches you could take. You know, listen, ask questions, discover your customer. You'd be amazed at what they tell you. You know, you don't lead a horse to water and make it drink. You let the horse lead itself to water. You let them decide and realize how thirsty they are by asking leading questions and letting them come to the conclusion. It's not easy. It takes years of practice to be effective at it, but great salespeople are. You know, it's a patience game. So don't don't push your customer because if you start pushing the customer, we've all been there, we get pushed away because you have to develop relationships. Sales can sometimes come across as sleazy, but that's only for people that don't care about the customer. To care about the customer, you have to know different things about them. What are the demographics? You know, when's their kid's birthday? You know, when's their birthday? When's their anniversary? Send them a card, send them a gift. Uh, obviously, you know, there are a lot of industries. There's uh, You got to know what that dollar amount of gift you can send is. But something simple like a card or just an email saying, happy birthday, I hope you have a great one. You'd be amazed at how much of an impression it makes, uh, especially when you, your friends enjoy it. So why wouldn't your business associates as well? You know, CRM, data, leverage the technology, uh, because you have to, there's so many data points you can collect. There's so much information that floats out there. The CRM or customer attention management software helps store and place those data points, helps with the automate that interaction, leverages the marketing so the salespeople can use it. Uh, but the biggest problem with CRMs is salespeople have to keep it current. Data is only as usable as it's current. Garbage in, garbage out. You know, especially when early on. The more earlier you start using CRM, the easier it is going to be establish best practices, like any good habit. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of CRMs out there. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but really, it's all about cost effective, cost effective and flexible. What are the features? You know, there's really, at the very face value, limited features you need, whether, you know, lead, contact, pipeline, and most importantly, reporting. But actually, the super most important thing is the ease of use. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times. Because if the salespeople can't use it, the marketing people can't like leverage it, you know, what good is it? If you just have a super complicated tool that nobody actually knows how to you know, work, make work, it's worthless. Uh, you know, so the, you gotta be able to have it scale with your business as people use it. You know, everything on it is phones these days. So access it anywhere because you gotta be able to use the computer in your pocket at any time and automate with integrations. Uh, because there's a bunch of cool tools that people have built around a lot of different CRMs that you can leverage. Instead of having that customization that you build or pay somebody to build for you, chances are you might be able to integrate it. And there's a lot of important data out there that you're storing in your CRM. So security is paramount. Make sure that it's safe. You know, additional considerations, you know, what are the fields you're entering besides basic contact information? You know, seconds are the essence for salespeople. They need to be able to access it, get the information they need, because especially in this digital world, they're probably jumping from meeting to meeting with a minute to spare. So what's at their fingertips that they can leverage to prepare for that next meeting in under 30 seconds? And one of the biggest things I talk about is that data and how useful you can make that data. Uh, the graphical representation of that data helps, you know, especially when it updates automatically every day. You can look at the top of top of your screen, see the highlights, where things are at, the pipeline, the revenue, the customers, uh, you know, start using it early, getting used to it. Uh, I was one of the first 400 employees at Groupon and I fully believe they were the fastest growing startup for a reason because they implemented a good CRM from the start and they kept it simple. Basic information to gather, this, you know, everybody has this, this is how you get a hold of them. Uh, and especially like when was the last time you talked to them? When should you follow up with them? And any personal notes like birthdays, anniversaries, what's the context of the conversation you had with them last time? You know, some of the key metrics that you're thinking about in terms of data, you know, what's the potential deal side, website interactions, previous purchases, what's their buying habits, uh, you know, form submissions, and anything, like I said, in terms of qualitative. So again, CRM is there to technology, use it, automate it. Uh, drip campaigns, you've seen it, you interacted with an ad, you search for something, all of a sudden you're getting chased around the internet by that same ad. That's because of the CRM automations leverage marketing to try and sell. And you can schedule, you'd be surprised actually how many phone conversations you have are reported. That data is fed in the CRM and stored for future purchases. Bunch of CRM brands out there. If nothing else, just use Excel. You know, you probably need just five or seven columns in terms of, you know, name, email, phone number, uh, 
put your notes next time follow up uh salesforce is super huge can be cumbersome can be very expensive hubspot's a little bit more modular uh zoho has a lot of different integrations um it's a little bit cheaper uh, but really you got to understand your organization what are the features that are out there and don't be sold by the salespeople. salesforce is great at selling and again there's a lot of different options out there that probably integrate with some of the existing technology you might already be paying for so the problem with sales doesn't have to be sleazy uh you know everybody has to sell within the organization especially the founders whereas marketing you should probably specialize and have people that are staying on focus and on target with that the founders and the ceo and the executive team they are the ones selling they have to set the tone and cadence almost like thinking of branding um, for sales they have to be the ones leading the charge because everybody in the organization is selling but at the same time the ceo and the executive team are the ones that are really waving that banner because they're the ones that have to step in sometimes for those big hard to close sales and make it you know sales is all about practice it's not easy so the more repetition you get the more you you know what's your pitch how well you do it um the more better you're going to be at it and you know i have this in here as fire fast but you know salespeople. Uh, it sometimes takes a long time to get onboarded. A lot of your organizations are small and nimble, don't have time. So, you know, don't be afraid to if you try and help and work with them. You, know, you have to move on to the next salespeople because there's a lot out there, unfortunately. And there, some are definitely better than others. So, again, what's the importance of sales, Mr. Krabs? Uh, it's money, bringing money into the organization so you can keep your organization driving. Driving revenue without the sales, organization goes out of existence because it doesn't have what it needs to survive money everything is sales to drive that purchasing decision nonprofit slant uh you know sales you know, relationship development one-on-one you know donor acquisition point of contact customer service if you will uh you know a, a good salesperson or a good nonprofit can use all those tools we just talked about to drive you know, donations through the door because whether it's an individual or corporate it's human to human at the end of the day uh, so, you know, really think about what's different and how you approach a customer. You get to pull on the heartstrings. Uh, you know, it's more of a soft selling. You get to customize pitches to the segment because, you know, nonprofits have a lot of different segments of people more so that would probably purchase a product. There's a lot more psychology involved in understanding what they're looking for. What are the keywords to pull and how they reach them? So, you know, best advice, ask for advice. You'd be surprised, especially with major donors or large organizations. Uh, you know, don't say, hey, I want your money. So, hey, do you have any advice on my materials, my marketing, uh, my approach? Do you know anybody? What audiences? The more you ask for advice, the more kind of psychology that comes into play of saying, hey, maybe I should just write them a check as well because you're forming that relationship. So, you know, again, nonprofits, more mission driven. Uh, you know, nonprofits are made of volunteers. So a little more cat herding uh, and wrangling, but you should still empower every person in your organization to sell. Give them the tools, give them the pitches, because if they're on the street, you never know who that you know volunteer that just came into the organization has a dear rich Aunt Sally who could write a huge check. You have to be able to give them the tools in order to you know, approach them and say, hey, would you like to make a, a donation? And instruction and donations are a big thing. And, you know, what's your membership versus just open solicitation? Uh, events work, galas, uh, you know, galas are some of the best sales events you could possibly have. Uh, I've got some qualms with, you know, the amount of money that some nonprofits spend, but it's amazing how you wine and dine some of your, your donors, customers, and they'll, you know, a couple sips and they'll open up their checkbook and add another zero than they probably wouldn't normally add it if you not had an event and wine and dine them. Again, nonprofits still got to collect that data. Sales 101. Uh, so strategy, probably we've already covered most everything. We're getting ready to repeat. So I hope you're listening. Um, Go to market is all about the strategy. Marketing and sales come together and join as one. Minimizes that risk to maximize the potential. You know, it's simple. Fail to plan, plan to fail. It helps reduce the time to market, increases the chance of success, optimizes your resource, waste is money out the door that you didn't make use of, and aligns all the internal teams and stakeholders to provide a clear map for execution. We're all in this together and we have to move together with that strategy because it's all about working across the organization. You know, it's not just marketing, it's not just sales. What are the product teams, customer service? What's your budget financing projections? How much is your marketing spend gonna bring in and your sales people going to generate? You know, and more importantly, legal. What are you doing? How are you saying it? There's a lot of highly regulated industries out there. So you gotta make sure in tune of saying and having 
legal forefront, uh, especially in some of the finance and nonprofit arenas. What you're saying isn't crossing the line, and it shouldn't be. Some of the key components, as we already said, in some of the marketing sales, you know, target market, know who you're selling to, what's your positioning, that value, what's your pricing, is it competitive, is it way out of line, uh, is it you know on target, or is it under under? Know that. What's your sales strategy to reach that customer? The customer experience that they have from that interaction with the marketing to the salespeople to create that competitive advantage of why they should buy or donate to you. Successful go to market is data driven, customer centric, you know, and then most importantly, adaptable. Don't be like the dodo, evolve. Don't go out of existence. We want you and need you to succeed, especially in the climate tech arena. Benefits, you know, again, as I already said, improve efficiency, reduce time to market, internal alignment, and really creates that improves that customer reception because it has that cohesiveness that works together. You've seen the brands that are disjointed and things don't sound and work properly together, but that, the ones that do, they have that competitive advantage because it tells that story like Adam was talking about that is cohesive. <clears throat> Again, you know, same information, the data, the metrics, what are you bringing together? How are you making it work? How is the data from marketing being leveraged for sales? How are they using it? How, what's the factors that you can evolve your strategy because of the data that you bring in terms of revenue projections, market penetration, customer acquisition. It's all about the data and how well you use it. Make sure it's useful data though. So thinking about nonprofits specifically, you know, again, who are you targeting? Uh, you're probably gonna have a lot more marketing tailored specifically to your audiences because you have several different audiences you need to stay in front of. Uh, you think about like your, your target customer market profile, and whether you do individuals, corporates, foundations, government agencies, they're all going to have different approaches. You know, ultimately, the go-to-market strategy is about acquisition and retention. Once you keep them as a donor, how do you keep them donating year over year? Stay in form of them. What's the cadence of communication? What is the information you're relaying to them? You have to clearly articulate your impact. You know, how many mouths did you feed? How many uh, gallons of oil did you keep from spilling into the ocean? Uh, how many pounds of plastic did you pick up? These are all things that found founders of nonprofits have to really focus on and executive teams need to think about in terms of articulating their impact to the different groups and how it's received. So again, point blank, marketing, sales, strategy, go to market. It's all about generating awareness, converting that awareness that customer into from a lead into a customer to minimize the risk, maximize potential so you succeed. We need you to succeed. We have to move faster. So we need you to employ everything we talked about from marketing, sales, and the strategy cohesively to succeed. Because while these are the basics, you know, one of the most important acronyms of sales is KISS. Keep it super simple. If you keep that, it's amazing how many companies and how many marketers and salespeople forget that simple lesson. But, you know, people are simple people. Customers are simple people. We just have to communicate to them the value, why they should buy, and convince them to buy. And everything we just covered is that point and the strategy to make sure you succeed. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you staying on. It's been a whirlwind of an hour. We covered a ton of information. If you found value from anything we just talked about, I implore you, please let the world know. We are doing a great mission of getting more people to work on climate here at Work on Climate. So tag us on LinkedIn, post on the Work on Climate Founders channel, ask your questions. Uh, you know, Jonathan Stokely, Adam Gordon, uh, I think our LinkedIn's were in the chat earlier. Feel free to post us, tag us, reach out to us. We're here to help. Uh, if anything you said was relevant, worthwhile, or useful, sure hope it was uh, because you need to use it. Uh, let, let the world know. We'll benefit from it. And hopefully clean tech startup will as well. So without that, uh, we've got a QR code. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you found, you know, worthwhile or you think this was garbage, let us know. Let us know how we can improve. There's a QR code. Scan it um, and go from there. We've got about three minutes. Um, like I said, we have a lot to unpack there. So if anybody's got a question, we'll field it uh, quickly. Otherwise, go over to Work on Climate and fill that out and let us know. Like I said, we'll be hosting, uh, hosting a lot of uh, hopefully answering questions for you. Uh, let's see anything important in the chat. Uh, oh, can you recommend the right channel for us? Yes, Kunth, uh, Founders Channel. 
on work on climate. Uh, we this is a founders channel presentation. Uh, so thank you. Uh, yeah, hashtag roll dash founders in Slack. Uh, we can repost some of those link. Uh, ah, how I've got one question with two minutes left. How does one leverage communities to do market research? I've been trying different communities, but haven't been able to find good communities to learn about uh, exporters. Any recommendations? Um, you know, a lot of response is the same signal as purchasing. People aren't responding. Uh, people aren't interacting with you. Chances are you're in the wrong community. Uh, if you're trying to talk to people in a room and nobody will talk to you, chances are you're in the wrong room. Uh, same thing with communities. If people aren't responding to you, maybe there's nobody there. Or if they are there, they're not listening. Or maybe your messaging and how you reach out to them isn't working. Uh, so, you know, if, if what you're doing isn't working, it's essential the basics of testing. Try something else. Adam, you got anything to add? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a really hard question, actually. And a lot of people um, are challenged with that. It's a lot of research. Um, a lot of digging. Um, there are some professional um, market researchers that may give you advice um, for little or no money. Um, leverage that as much as you possibly can. Um, that is basically finding those initial audiences and, and being able to penetrate them. One of the major challenges in marketing. Thank you, Adam. Well, we're at the top of the hour. It went fast again. If you found anything worthwhile, let the world know, post and tag us on LinkedIn. Fill out, please fill out our QR code so we can understand what you found value or what you didn't like about it. And we can go from there and we'll see you over in the Roll Founders Work on Climate Slack community where we can help answer any questions. And we hold off weekly office hours. Uh, so, you know, jump in, message us. We're here to help. Uh, that's what we're all about. It's running it together. So let's build something great together. And thanks to each and every one of you for, um, for being here today. We really appreciate your presence. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.